Hey, this is Keith Lockhart from Oxygen Forensics Training. I have Amanda Mahan with me from our team, and welcome to a series, as it turns out, of webinars about making the world a safer place. So our first in the series is, you know, using technology to address an illicit image investigation and just all the different problems that we typically run into and what we can do with Oxygen Forensic Detective uh, to tackle those problems. So in doing that, because Amanda and I are going to be your guide and, and conversation pieces through this webinar and all the subsequent ones, it makes sense that we take a second to introduce ourselves. So my name is Keith Lockhart, if I haven't met you in the world. Um, I came to Oxygen about a year ago to grow training and uh, build some new fun things around the new release of Detective and the 12.0 version. And uh, I have a previous computer forensic history, which is kind of an interesting conversation point because I meet more and more uh, mobile forensic folks that don't have a computer forensic history. And that's a crazy assumption I'm trying to break. But it also lends a lot of different thought processes about how I go about teaching technology and opinions I have about technology. And sometimes it's great and sometimes I smash my head through the wall. So I spent the previous 16 years at Access Data running training with FTK, which is a, a tool that's based on the database. And I mentioned that because it's super lucky for me um, that Oxygen Forensic Detective is based on a database, which means we can really tackle some of those problems that you'll see us outline in, in this webinar and others in a really analytic, efficient fashion. It does us a world of justice, and I happen to have a, a ton of thought around that, uh, being a database technology as we go. So I want to give that brief introduction, and Amanda's on here with me as well. I want her to tell us a little bit about herself. And, you know, I have a law enforcement background prior to the computer technology world and did some instruction at a place called National White Collar Crime Center, so it's been a, a long, interesting, hey, let's teach technology um, from an investigative mindset to help get jobs done in a better, efficient, maybe uh, much more money-efficient uh, methodology than some of the ways that have been out there before. So I bring that. Amanda, if you don't mind, tell us your background and what sure. you're doing before you got here and what you're doing now. Awesome. Okay. My name is Amanda Mahan. I've been with Oxygen as a contract instructor for almost two years now. And um, after, let's see, September, what was it? September of last year, 2019, I started full-time with Oxygen. So previous, I was a digital forensic analyst with Otaga County Sheriff's Office in Alabama. And I just happened to uh, be the first one for the county and began the computer forensic, cell phone forensic lab there. And uh, shortly after I started there, I uh, joined in with law enforcement ICAC task force. So that was a huge step for our county. And working joint with the city, we were able to accomplish a lot. Um, the reason I'm with Oxygen, I believe, began right then. Uh, the, the only software we could afford was Oxygen. It just so happened it was the most robust, in my opinion, and I use it all of the time. So that is where I gained my passion for the so to use the software. No, 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 Amanda. Okay. So to be clear, Amanda, the real reason you're here is because you and I got together last April to go through some detective training. What happened? <laughs> True, true, true. So it was my second class teaching for Oxygen at headquarters. And back in the back row sits this, my new boss, Keith. I'd never met him before. And he was the most interruptive student I think I've ever oh, had. Not true. Okay, but not true. it is absolutely true. <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, our, the discussion turned to, hey, what do you think about working here full time? Let's let's rebuild some of this material. Let's make this robust. Let let's make this work. And so eventually we did. So um, instead of uh, having to examine child exploitation material, I now have this huge opportunity to where I have the ability to teach thousands of people now what I used to do using uh, detective and. Uh, if I have that opportunity to spread the word, to teach, to make the, the world a better place while not having to view these images myself, I am on board. So I was really excited to join the team. You know, we've been doing this together for probably full time, about six months or so, Amanda. And I think I did a, an interview one time where I said, this fills my love tank as an educator. 
Uh, you just get this bug right. to try to help people do a better job. And if you lived through something that was bad, make it so somebody else doesn't have to, for Pete's sake. Yeah, so that's right. great. Yeah, agreed. Um, I'm super glad we got together. I'm super glad you, you came on with oxygen and we're making some cool stuff. So anyway, that's, Absolutely. Uh, if you're going to spend all the time with us listening to these webinars, it's only fair that we at least introduce ourselves. So when we do make the wise cracks, we make or have the thoughts we have, you kind of have a background in why. So anyway, <clears throat> our first, our first one is the illicit image investigation. And, you know, Amanda and I are talking about this and we come up with uh, a set of problems that we're going to try to address. Some of the big ones that she ran into routinely and that we hear out in the industry um, especially as you kind of figure out what detective can do and people start thinking, oh, but can you make it do this? And can you make it do that? And I would say one of my most common responses to questions like that in class, because it's a database technology are, oh yeah, there's, you know, 95% of the time, my answer is it's a database. We can probably figure out how to do that. So the first one on the list is tackling large data sets. And I'll introduce the conversation just to say that if you're a detective user, um, and you haven't made the, the leap to version 12 over version 11. I mean, it's been a good six months, October, November, December, January, February, March, quite a few months at this point. You got to do this. And primarily, I would say, with relevance to this bullet, you know, a 32-bit architecture of detective in the 11 world just does not handle big data like the 64-bit architecture of version 12 does. I mean, it's night and day. And the fact that we can do concurrent extractions and import, I mean, that's great, but only if you have the, the backbone to support that. I mean, for instance, you know, four or five gray key dumps at a time would kill 11, and 12 just kind of sits back and says, what else you got? So it's that type of analogy I want to put in front of us when we talk about tackling large data. And then just, Amanda, I know you have the tool and want to show a couple of things like that to really exemplify it. But I want to give that background right. only because, Amanda, you might remember, my first experience with the job was getting somewhere, dumping gray key in, and then coming back over lunch going, really? Failed? That's right. That's not cool at all. <laughs> so that, that stuck in my head. I'm glad this is one of our top problems to address because I always have that in the back of my mind. Let's make someone not have that bad day. So perfect, right. Amanda. Um, I'm going to just kill this presentation so you can take over the screen, and we will start like that. So, okay, Amanda, here's your screen. Have at it. All right, so one of my biggest problems when I walked into any house on a search warrant was, oh my gosh, I've got a half a dozen phones or more, a couple of computers, I've got all kinds of uh, maybe some memory cards, thumb drives, what am I gonna do with all this data? So most of my investigations always ended up being on the cell phone. So I want, I wanna show you that it is not as difficult as you think ingesting all this data doing all of these extractions concurrently. So I just wanna show you right now how many I, devices I have set up to extract. You can see I have an iPhone, a Samsung, I have a memory card and a Huawei phone. And I can do this all at once, which is a huge time saver. And as soon as I'm finished, I can pull all of this data straight over in Detective to be parsed, and then I can do my analysis. So I would consider you showing off, Amanda, but you're not. I mean, that's actually, uh, I've watched you do this and just say, you know what, I don't have time for this. I'm going to get them all going, and I'll just minimize them out of the way while it still work. And when they're done, yeah, I'm going to turn around and import them all at the same time while I'm still doing other stuff. So, you know, I, I would accuse you, but it's actually really valid what you have on the screen right there. So, yeah, okay, go on. Cool. All right. So once we've finished with all of our extractions on all the devices, and we know that's probably where most of our problem solving is anyway, doing cell phone extractions. So now that I've shown you that you can do all of these extractions at the same time, let me show you some more information that will help you. And it's in our configuration settings. If we navigate to our menu on our home screen and we go to our options, we can see in our advanced analytics that we already have something called image categorization, which can come in to play big time. It can help call your data. It will flag all of those images that you're looking for straight away. So Amanda, let me just stop for a second because I want to make sure I'm tracking with what you're saying as well. So from a, from a large data standpoint, we get happy because we can extract a ton of devices concurrently and then pull them back into the tool, A, while we're still working, B, at the same time and see in much greater fashion than we could in the 32-bit world versus the 64 one. 
Okay, so Amanda, before you before you leave this configuration screen, I just want to make sure I'm tracking and everybody listening is in that. So we're taking the image categorization algorithms, and rather than you doing all the, you know, let me sit down for an hour and go look at everything that would be pornography or nudity or drugs or alcohol, let the tool do that, right? Let those algorithms go do something repetitive and, I mean, menial is probably not the right word, but your subjective thought process can be applied much more effectively other ways in the case. Let the tool do this, even to include you know, facial recognition or categorization at some point where, who are these people? And they're getting pictures with these people. And I've been trying to find a face right. and a name with that one right there. So, yeah, I mean, you, you're not even importing your data yet, but you're configuring what it looks like, the tool to get busy and help you, you know, make things available yeah, for exactly. you Yeah, exactly. Okay, good. Remember good. how much data I said you're having to bring in. I mean, let the tool do some of that work for you. And not only are you running image categorization, you have control over what you're going to run. Let's say that you don't need to look for weapons, extremism, graphic violence, but you want to make your thresholds for pornography, nudity, child abuse, you want to make those lower so it pulls in more images for you so you can make the determination whether or not this is truly a child abuse image or nudity or pornography. So you're casting a wider net, you know, so you can apply your own subjectivity to it if you have to, and maybe not even casting exactly. a net for some of those things that are irrelevant at the moment for this particular investment. That's right. That's, no, that's right. That's super good and stuff you, to know. Right. And you can always wait to run your image categorization until after you have imported your device. So this, what we're looking at now are your configurations upon import. So you've done your extraction. You're going to pull this extraction into Detective. And what we're doing right here is telling it, I want you to go ahead and start working for me. Find all these images that I'm interested in seeing, the ones that I need to analyze. Yeah, it's literally, so, I mean, this this segues right into the, though we absolutely need this kind of technology for the larger data sets, our next big bullet to tackle was finding things of interest. And right. we're setting up the tool to get busy on our behalf. So, yeah, please continue. Okay. So that's not all that we can do, though. Let's navigate back to our options screen and look here at the bottom. You've got hash sets and keywords that you can run against this data as you import it. Let's have a look at our hash sets. At this point, if I participate in Project Vic, this is where I can put that hash set right here to run against the data as it imports. So you can Amanda, also find, let yeah. Me, just, let me just clarify for everyone, okay. just we're on the same page. And, and if you put your mouse down on that little text down at the bottom with MD5, SHA-1, right, right up there above that button, if you're not, if, if you're watching this and don't know what a hash set is, this is not a common or not an uncommon issue. Um, let's have a set of data, run a math algorithm against it, and get a result. And you'll hear this referenced as the digital fingerprint for a file, because if you change the slightest bit of data in that file content, it has nothing to do with the name, nothing to do with the dates, creation, modify, whatever. If you change the content and run the same math, your resulting value is different, completely different. So much so. It's like the digital fingerprint. And some of those algorithms are MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256, the photo DNA algorithms that are right there in that little text content. And, you know, back in my day, there were hash keeper sets of, of adjudicated illicit images where people would say, hey, listen, here's the value. It's not the file. I'm not going to make you look at the file. But if you get the same math using the same algorithm I did, ding, 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 good for you. So I just want to make sure that everybody's on that same page of what a hash value is for us and how it's significant, especially when we're trying to configure the tool to do more work for us. So there you go. I'll leave it at that. All right. So at this point, if we want to import a hash set, this is where we can do this. And it doesn't have to be Project Vic. It can be any hash set that you are concerned with. And it can be MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256. You can see the different types that you can import here. So let's go ahead and import a Project Vic hash set. And I just have a small one here to demo for you. Now that we've imported it, we can set it to run against every device that comes into Detective, every d device that we've either imported or that we've done the extraction and we're pulling over into Detective. And we also have the ability to run known files 
which is they're already in here for you. These hash sets are already listed. You can run them against any Android or iOS. And basically you can flag those as not relevant just to make your reports less cumbersome. So, so Amanda, on the other, the one side of the coin is, wow, uh, in the example we're using Project Vic Data, that's stuff I want to know right away, right? Show me that stuff. Bring it to my attention. We certainly want to be alerted to these right away by comparison to those other ones you were just showing, the known file hashes, which are, what were they, iOS and Android OS, I think. Yeah, look, if we can eliminate those from consideration because they are legitimately the operating system files, hey, more power to us. Again, using the tool to, uh, you know, by by deductive reasoning of removing things that aren't relevant uh, allows more things that are relevant to bubble up more effectively. Right. Okay, Amanda, so I think from a hash perspective, you know, we've got the algorithms working one side of the fence for us, and on the hash side, hopefully we're importing values that can either get rid of stuff we don't care about uh, so it can more effectively show us stuff we do care about. But before we leave hashing, I want to jump back to something can you hit that add hash set button down there and i I just want to jump back here because of things you've said to me in the past like oh get me out of this i'm so sick of my brain having to look through things like this but here (laughs) right you know those two options right there i think you called it one time saving your brain what are those doing if you that's right those right there what happens So if I don't want to see the images that Project Vic has told me, these are bad images, I have the option to turn that off in my interface. And I also have the option right here to make sure the thumbnails don't show up in a report. So I'm not printing any of that material. Yeah, A, heaven forbid you distribute it, way to go. Or uh, B, I mean, I'm thinking about this from the reviewer standpoint. I mean, it's super common. The technical folks are doing one thing. And they're turning data back around to people to help with review because there's so much of it. And I think the last thing I really want to do is subject them to things like that if they don't want to see it. I mean, but that's some of the value of the hash is, look, if, if this is flagged as a match, you don't have to look at it, right? So if it, by, by right. nature, we have a thumbnail view for pictures. That's just a great way to look at them. But you know what? If they're these, don't put the thumbnail up there. I think there's intrinsic value right. on both sides of the sanity check with that for a reviewer, for someone like you that was doing the work all the time. So I just want to touch on those before you left hashing. I appreciate it. Exactly. It is a brain saver is what this says. If these have already been verified as um, CSAM, child sexual abuse material, then why have to look at it again when you've already got the verification that that's exactly what it is? Remember how we talked about a hash is like a a DNA for, for an image. As long as that hash value is the same, it's guaranteed that that's going to be the same image on the other end. Absolutely. So another tool that Detective has, let's go back to our configurations, are the keywords. There are already some keyword lists built in for you, but here we can actually enter a new list or we can import a list. Depending on whatever kind of case you're working, you may, you probably already have your own keyword lists. Import that here and let this work for you also. I mean, and we're talking text easy. files, right, Amanda? Just a list of text words? That's right, just yeah. a text file. And um, you can build your own key, keyword list right here inside of Detective also. You can name it and add or take away keywords, just as you can take away keywords easily in the list that are already populated for you or enter new keywords. Yeah, you know, my days were largely NARC-related from a, a dope perspective, and I miss that tremendously, so much fun. But I could remember uh, other instances importing keyword lists that were, you know, slang, teen slang, you know, the numbers and the symbols that mean, oh, call me back in five minutes, my mom's watching over my right. shoulder or something like that. And to, that's always changing and updating. Exactly. And, you know, you're, again, I'm all about putting up the red flags. The more red flags I can go investigate as soon as my data is done, I mean, the faster I get to work, right? And if I can, if I understand what Correct. you're saying here... We can pull this list in just like we had the hash values and hopefully see things waiting for us on the other side when our data imports complete. That's right. It's an, just another tool in our toolbox to do the work for us before we can, we have to get over and start the analytics. Perfect. Okay. But during that simultaneous import, we're using algorithm or algorithmic work uh, and some human interaction by providing known hash values and keywords to help us go find these things before we even get access to our case. 
right? Before that data is even input, we, we've got a lot of work being done on our behalf. Our next big problem set that we're trying to address is the distribution chain or something more along the lines of, well, once we get in there, who made these things? Who are they giving them to if they are? And who has them? If they didn't make them, who's possessing them, right? And it's right. that, then I think that will allow you to say, you know what, let's go look at the case. Let's see what happens with all these things in place and start finding where they are. And once we find them, what can we find out about them? Once we find these images, what can we find out about them relative to the analytics of yeah. who's made them, how they get here, where are they gone, all that stuff. Okay, so Amanda, we're inside Detective now with the idea that we've we've laid out the upfront work that we're hoping Detective did for us. You know, we had image categorization, uh, project Vic values, other hash values, maybe key list or keyword list, anything we can do to get a, a step up. And that segues to our next set of bullets, which is kind of a combination, you know, creation, distribution, possession. Who made this? Who might they be giving these things to or receiving them from? Um, are they making it? Do they have it? And are they actually sending? So I say we just start on the on the right hand side at the lowest hanging fruit. Does this extraction have anything bad in it? And, you know, based on all the things we outlined in the last 20 minutes, answer that question for us, Amanda, based on some of the things we should or should not see after our import. All right. So let's say we've got our target A's device and we want to navigate into that. So the first thing we want to see is, do they possess any of those images that we're looking for? So what I would do here is, as soon as I have my target A's device parsed and pulled over into Detective, I would immediately go to the file section and look for all of the images there. And remember, we have done image categorization already, so we should see the results of that. We've pulled in that Project Vic JSON and now we can see how it's compared to the information that we have in this device. So I want to go to the file section and see exactly what hits I get compared to the Project Vic JSON so, that I imported. Hold on right there, Amanda. When you say you're going to the file section, and I see I'm, I'm playing, oh, I can see colorful things. You're in the general sections section area, I guess, of the tool on this file section. So I just want to make sure that when we talk about this, look, if we're trying to see the files themselves in our extraction, guess what? Go to the files section. But Amanda, I, you and I joke about this, but I know you're going to find it hard to believe if you want to go see the calls from this extraction, where would we go? <laughs> and I emphatically well. throw that out there. <laughs> the calls section, right? Same thing for messages okay. or any one of these. So if this is your first time watching Detective or you're trying to figure out a way to get to data more quickly. That's what these sections are designed to do is scoot you along right where you're trying to go. And in this case, Amanda's like, I'm clamoring to see results from our upfront work, from our categorizations or our product or hash comparisons or anything else like that. So Amanda's jumping right to the file section where, as we will see, there is all kinds of file breakdown and categorization for us just waiting to show good or bad or indifferent. So that's when she says she's going to a section, I want to make sure we're all talking about the same definition of section, especially when it comes to files. So sorry to interrupt you, Amanda. I just want to lay that out for everybody. That's okay. Yeah. And in the file section, we can filter straight to any camera shots or images. And so that's really what mm -hmm. I'm interested in. So here we go. So immediately I see that I have hits from my project Vic JSON and I see what category they are under the Project Vic category. Now this is in the center of the screen, the meat of your information, the grid section where anything, if you look in our column one, which is on the left-hand side of your screen, we're looking at target A's device. And if I click on that device, I'm looking at all files within the section in the second column, which is your center column. And down below on the bottom of this section, if I click on anything with a duplicate, it's going to show me where all of these duplicates are located. And by and so I'm all about the eye candy, Amanda. By duplicate, you you clicked on that one and said it was a duplicate. Why? Well, if you look at the top of your screen in the center, you can see uh, that yes. we have a drop down menu right here. And we're looking at all files. We can look at files just with duplicates or without duplicates or we can show deduplicated files. Right now, I'm looking at all files. 
but I can still see which files have duplicates and how many. Some have two and some have three. So anything anything with that little icon, which would have a number bigger than one, probably that's indicating a duplicate for us. Okay. Right, right. Gotcha. And right next to it, this symbol indicates that this is embedded. This is the embedded file. Okay. So this could be a thumbnail. Mm -hmm. So let's look at one of these images that Project Vic says that this is child abuse material. And of course, this is a mock JSON because we're not going to use a real one in this demo. So as you can yes, see, I'm we're going to assume that this is pretend. an illicit yes. image. <laughs> Please <laughs> okay, pretend, cool. Amanda. Please pretend. <laughs> All right. I'm going to. <laughs> so this is going to be our illicit image. And if we look down at the bottom of the screen in your center column, you can see that there are three files that match. How do we know that they match? Well, they have the same hash value, so we have a match. And if we scroll back to the left, remember that this indicates it's an embedded file. So let's click on that embedded file and look in the column on your right. This is column three here, and we can see exactly where this file is coming from. Where is it embedded at? And we can see here in the full path that this embedded image is located in the address book images SQLite database. And so to make this a little easier for us, let's go to the database tab and locate that database. And I see it right here. If we double click on this, we're going to open up our SQLite viewer. In here, we can dig down and find that image that we were looking for. So Amanda, so you just, just because the magic is happening before my eyes, you just double clicked on that database, pulled it open in the built-in SQLite viewer, which you know, as far as one of my favorite things is like, wow, I don't have to go get another one because this was already integrated and I just fired it up right from within the file section. And I remember you showing me this before. You're going to go look at the thumbnail image table inside here. And I know that one's in there, right? So I, yeah, I'm pretty right sure here. it was there and I don't mean to drive, but I get excited because when I go there, if I look at the data column over there, the, what, the two, four, it's like the six column over, you know, I'm computer forensic background guy, right? And if I see JFIF and my world, I'm like, pictures. So not only are we digging down inside this database with the viewer, but I'm looking at those thinking to myself, you know what? I want to see what these are. And look at that. This drives me crazy. I mean, good crazy. But that's the fact that we're, what I think you just did, Amanda, was say, hey, listen, I found a Project Vic responsive file. Here it is. Matter of fact, there are several versions of that, which is going to take us to the next next branch up in the low-hanging fruit tree, possession to maybe distribution or uh, creation. If there are multiple copies, that might be multiple good charges for us. But you found one that was embedded inside something else, happens to be a database, and now you're inside the database, going to find the actual embedded version of it. And I think it's at the bottom from that time you showed me uh, further in the list. But the point, that whole thing we just outlined, how you got us from wow, I didn't know anything. I used some of my upfront technology to give me red flag hits when I finally got into the case. And in five minutes, I find an embedded version of one of those red flag hits inside a database. Hmm, as you can start doing your fingers together saying, excellent, you got a lot of stuff in front of you here. <laughs> right, and once you know where you're looking, Continue looking in that same file path, in that same database. You may find something that maybe Project Vic hasn't hit on for you yet. So keep digging. So All right. I, I think that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. So, yeah, keep digging. And I would say, because I've already, I've already started climbing the ladder based on that previous conversation, go back to the file section, Amanda. And I want to look. I saw a tab back there I want to make sure we talk about. Because if I go in our in our third bullet there, if I go left to distribution, um, my look, I'm just going to throw my premise out there that if I'm taking pictures with the camera and my phone, um, more than likely those pictures are going to have the extensible information data about the camera 
of my phone attached to the right. picture, that X of information. And yeah, that tab yeah, right so. there, camera shots. I mean, what what, right. is, what is the camera shots thing doing for us, Amanda, that, that it has its own tab? What's the point of that? Well, this tells me that this came from likely this camera that we're looking at. And look at all this exit data. We have geo coordinates, our creation date, modified date, the full path. You know what? Go down in the in the bottom of column three, Amanda, and you're gonna have to scroll down, I think, just because of our screen real estate. Yeah, click show the full information of that stuff. Because, you know, and I think of the the whole sexting case. If I can find a lot of copies of the pictures all over all over the community. But then I find the one that has the EXIF data. I'm blaming that person for having taken the picture because all that stuff gets stripped out when you start sending it around. But yeah, if I can say the original picture has this and maybe tie it back to the device, you know, I'm cooking with gas that day or something. You know, my, my day's going to be a little better if I can right. start finding more corroborative information like that. So I just want to make sure we touched on that tab because, again, it's, it's pre categorization by the tool for us based on exif information which probably says it came from the camera and of course look right. anytime we can put somebody somewhere with geo coordinates you know we'll come back some other day and start putting people on the map with regard to this but you know you can click right on one of those and be on the map in a heartbeat but if i take us out there we'll never come back <laughs> so yeah we we'll to right. make sure we touched on that it's it's like finding a piece of gold when you find a coordinate inside of one of these images um, and here you can find the make and the model of the of the device that took this image. So that's very important because like you said, in social media now, almost every application that you're going to use is going to strip that EXIF data from the device. So if it's an incoming photo, we're likely not gonna have any of this information. This is telling me this is an image taken with this device. Next step, is it an outgoing image? Maybe we have distribution then. So that's something we really need to pay attention to. Oh, you know where I wanna go for that. Hold on one second. Okay, Amanda, so if, if we're in our third bullet and we just hit some great ideas about from the low-hanging possession fruit standpoint ideas, you know, especially even looking at duplicates and embedded things and who knows where you're going to find really the, the things you want and all of your extracted data. Um, and we even talked about some creation stuff, looking at EXIF and, you know, having to hold me back from going out to the map because I see coordinates and I just have to click on them. So take me, take my focus away from that. Um, hey, what's that tag right there, by the way? That little purple tag right there. So this was put here by our image categorization. And this tag actually lets us know that this may be associated with alcohol. Uh -huh. Sorry, that was just a great mm -hmm. thing to point out while we're looking right there. Um, yeah, so okay. let's go look at the social graph. And, you know, if you're not familiar with the social graph as a viewer, this is one of the analytic tools uh, available to a user that is, I don't know, the evolution of taking a picture, putting it on the wall, and tying a string from it to another picture on the wall to try to so, show some type of association between this person and that person. So in this scenario, as we're going to, uh, going to pretend... What we have available to us is account-based information with contact-based information and the source of the communication between the accounts and contacts and even the type, whether it's a phone call or a message. And this is the whole, again, the old school, put pictures together and tie strings between them or, you know, the analyst notebook uh, view or who's talking to who and how, really. And Amanda, just to, to understand that, go down to the bottom of your column one and turn off the messages. We just only want to look at calls between everybody in the social graph. Oh, interesting. Or, you know, turn off or turn the messages on and turn off calls where we just want to see the messages. I mean, this is part of looks that. Looks like more is mes more messages than anything in Certainly, this Certainly, yeah, it looks like more messages. And this is because of that database, you know, capability where we can just tick things off and on and really filter through it. So let's pretend um, I, I'm not worried about groups right now, even though in this kind of investigation, I might be all about groups. But just to help clean things up as we're looking at things, I'm going to turn off the groups with Amanda doing just that click box right there. And now if we pull out the, the Allison large account with the sunglasses in the middle of that group over there and just, you know, do something like that. So that's, 
when you're when you're looking at that with the human eye, that's pleasing to say, oh, this one person must be talking to all those other people. And this is the true thing, and I want to do a couple things to help us visualize, hmm, maybe this person is talking to these people, and there is the chance that we might find if this person is sending some of those graphics or those images that we are so interested in right now to other people. So the first thing I'm going to do to help clean up a little bit of our chaos is in the contact section over there in the first column where Amanda has has uh, kind of expanded it, there are numbers there that indicate the number of communications between the account at the top and the contacts in that list. And look at some of the ones that have the number one, like, I don't know, um, Kakao Talk or Telegram or Viber or WhatsApp. Are those really your contacts? I mean, are you best friends with Viber <laughs> or WhatsApp as a, as a person or a contact? Amanda, so let's go up to the view drop down in our toolbar up there and make sure we're looking at the communications pane. And, you know, that's off by default for so we have more real estate for our graph, essentially. But, okay, here are the actual communications. Amanda, if you go double-click on WhatsApp in the column one there, just as a fun trick to narrow down just to the WhatsApp. Oh, there's the one WhatsApp message between our target and WhatsApp. And the description is your WhatsApp code is blah, blah. Okay, that looks like one of those, you know, verification code messages or a, a 2FA thing. Who cares about that one is what my point is there. So, Amanda, go up and, and uh, turn all the contacts back on again. Perfect. Thank you. And let's look at, let's double click on, um, I don't know, Facebook, right in the middle. Because I'm best friends with Facebook. It's my favorite contact of my entire life. And I look at it and 6 through to, is your confirmation. Okay. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say a ton of those one-offs, you know, might be things I don't want to see. So turn all the contacts back on, Amanda. And we're going to use that little filter at the top that says all. And, you know, by the number of communications is what's going on here. So if you bump that up greater than zero, greater than one, it grays all those greater than ones out, kind of filters them out of our view. So in essence, we're just down to the real people, the real contacts. I mean, Get Taxi, there's two. Apparently, that's the app for going to get taxis and obviously having communications with them. But, you know, we can go through them all, but this helps us organize some of the chaos. So, Amanda, while you're here, sweep everybody. It just left-click on your mouse and grab the whole yes, yes, yes. And as that happens, that selects everybody and all of their, message down, all of their messages down below. Now, I'm trying to find ones like right there, stop or go past and then go back. <laughs> I see how it make me drive like, oh, stop right there. Look at that one. <laughs> okay, look at the Viber message toward the bottom, and you're laughing because you know I'm all excited. Not only is there a paperclip, which is generally indicative of what? An attachment. An image. An image. That's right. Um, not only is there, but it's got a, an X on it, which generally means what? Even better. It might be deleted and recovered, and it's sitting right there with coordinate information. So before I go absolutely nuts on that, and I won't, I promise, just go up, Amanda, and sort on the description column for me. Because ding, 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 that is my gold mine. Viber, WhatsApp, a bunch of messages with attachments that may or may not have been deleted that I can go look at later. And now I'm hitting on that, hmm, did, these, did some of these pictures maybe leave this device? Or did maybe other ones arrive this way? I mean, yeah, they're on the phone. That's great. How'd they get there? Or where did they go if they were taken here? These are the things we're trying to figure out when we have the data at our fingertips. What do these designators mean? What does this social graph do for us? How does it indicate communication between people? How do we even know these things on here are valuable? Maybe because of Project Vic. Maybe I can show that the same picture was sent out seven different times, and that's seven new charges for me to plea with. <laughs> Anyway, man, I just want to take that minute and go through some of the social graph capability so we could finish off that third bullet on possession, distribution, creation, and, you know, several variations of those in between. What else would you add right. to that, Amanda? Well, let's not forget that Detective has a pretty good system of maps set up. So if we were interested to see if one of these geocoordinates is somewhere around our victim then we would definitely follow up on these coordinates just by clicking it 
which would take us out to a map, which I hope we're going to get to show them later oh, in just another click demo. On it. Click on it. Can't take it. Click on one of them. Yeah, because you're segueing perfectly into the next bullet, which is interagency corroboration. And that bullet is way, the way it is because you know we're going to play the part of the agency who goes to the next county and says, listen, we got this guy or this girl. We got this target. I'll be fair to uh, everyone. We got this target. And it just so happens they say something like, yeah, we were going to ask you the same thing. Here's these things on a, a place or a map in our county. Got anything like it? And I see you've clicked on one coordinate, taken it out to a largely zoomed-in view um, of a satellite view on a map. And, wow, I just want to go nuts there, but I won't. We'll come back to that. I think we'll pause at part one right here. And when we come back for part two, we'll figure out how to start comparing between this map and that map and this device and that device and see how that changes our communication patterns or maybe our distribution patterns or our matches on, hey, this person has this and so does that person over there. You know, so we, we start our conversation with how do we even get to this stuff, whether it's one device or many devices. And then once we find it, how do we place culpability or exculpability around it? And then once we've done that, how do we give it to somebody? I mean, we'll work together with other people as our corroboration part, but how do we then report on all of this and make it make sense to whoever it is that matters in our world? Okay, Amanda, what else would you close us out with before we uh, come back for part two later? I would say that it's also easy to take data from other agencies and import it right here. For example, if you have a CDR, we can overlay that on the information that we already have from your target A's device. Man, you're supposed to give information that lets us get out of the video today. And now I just want to go stay in the video today. <laughs> nice. No, perfect. You're obviously setting us up for next time as well. Okay, everybody. Listen, thanks for watching. This is part one in what we consider to be an ongoing, long-term series of whatever kind of fun we can get into in the tool to help you guys use it better day to day. So I would say thanks, Amanda, for the time uh, helping out with Thank with you. our thing here and everybody keep on learning we will see you next time